Welcome to Hafner Vineyard and the Zoom video room here, which used to be the uh, couple hours earlier was the production area of the winery. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are expecting about 125 people this afternoon for uh, an update, a preview of harvest. Um, let me start by saying that we had intended to do this last week, but Mother Nature in the form of the Wallbridge fire and a lot of lightning strikes uh, scuttled those plans. And we're particularly appreciative of your flexibility um, so that you could join us today. Last week, it would have been a preview of harvest, but um, Mother Nature doesn't stop and um, harvest is well underway, as you will hear from Park and David. Um, one of the wonderful things about being out in the country is that it's beautiful and quiet and bucolic, and one of the challenges <laughs> is that sometimes internet connectivity isn't particularly great. So we hope that you have a clear signal and we don't freeze frame too much. Uh, Harvest is um, sort of the crescendo of the year, and um, we're particularly uh, pleased that Park and David have the time today in the midst of all the busyness to uh, share with you a sense of how the 2020 harvest is going. And one of the things that I think is interesting is um, all the decisions that are made which have an impact on the vintage and have an impact on the glass of wine that you might be holding right now. Um, uh, lots of decisions uh, about when to pick and so forth, um, but we'll look forward to hearing from Park and David. Um, in many respects, if you've been to the winery, Park doesn't need an introduction, but um, as a little brother, I'm still going to uh, uh, speak with pride about his education at Davis, his work in Napa Valley and in Burgundy, and then coming here in 1981, 82 to build the winery. And we've been fortunate that he's been the winemaker here since day one. And you know the most important part about his CV, which is what you enjoy when UPS or shows up at your door with a delivery of Hafner wine. David Hubel is our vineyard manager, uh, local, local boy, uh, done well. Uh, and um, uh, after a, uh, getting a degree in mathematics at UC Santa Cruz, we're grateful he came back to his hometown and that we've had the good fortune to have him working with us overseeing the vineyard crew. Uh, in, a, in a normal time, we would be welcoming you in person to Hafner Vineyard but this is not a normal time, as all of you know. So um, we appreciate being able to um, come to you live and um, through Zoom, but we so look forward to the day when we can welcome you back here in person. And speaking of COVID, one of the things uh, that um, those of us in agricultural agriculture have the benefit of is working in a situation where there is the certainty of seasonal change, which, um, you know, winter leads to spring, leads to harvest, leads to winter. And um, in this day, these days, when there is so much uncertainty and so much is unpredictable and unknown, it is very grounding for us to be involved in an enterprise where we know that there's the certainty of a new season, a new year, and a new vintage, hopefully, for you to enjoy. 
in any case, uh, I'm Scott. I'm going to uh, exit stage right and turn it over to the winemaker. Good afternoon. Um, this is the time of year that we all look forward to. And I was just thinking about the fact that it's September 1st. In a normal year, we would probably just now be starting our harvest. But in fact, we've already wrapped up the Chardonnay harvest. Uh, so we can give you an update on how it went and uh, what we're looking forward to for the rest of the year. Harvest is the time uh, when it's all hands on deck, vineyard and winery crew. And our vineyard crew is made up of David, our vineyard manager and eight guys, six of whom are pictured there, or seven of whom. And um, they're all full-time guys, a couple of brothers. A lot of them are friends from the same small town in Mexico, a long time ago. And then in the winery, our crew consists of myself, uh, Sarah, my wife, Ricardo, who is, whose father worked in the vineyard here for 35 years or so and retired a couple of years ago. And then uh, our French intern. So the four of us do the harvest here at the winery. And the photograph you see there is uh, Pierre Bardenay from saint Emilion, who was our French intern last harvest. Unfortunately, uh, COVID put the kibosh on the internship program from the school where we get our interns. And we started this program in 1985 and it was uh, really a result of my having had the opportunity to intern in France the year before we built the winery and seeing what an impact it made on, on myself. And uh, we wanted to reciprocate. So starting in 1985 and every year since then, we've had a strapping young Frenchman, usually 20 or 21 years of age, living with us for three months, working with us, going on vacation with us, and becoming a part of our family then and in most cases uh, forever. But we have many very close friendships uh, in France as a result of this program. Um, backing up just a little bit, in uh, August, is when uh, July and August is when we do bottling. We finished bottling this year on August 7th, which left us a couple of weeks to get prepared. And what that means is that we had to move uh, a lot of wine around that was uh, going to be bottled this coming January or July of next year, in the case of our red wine, which is two years from harvest to bottling. So we had to move wine around to make room for this year's wine. Plus then we had to clean everything. And you see a few photographs of uh, particularly Ricardo uh, in action, cleaning various pieces of equipment there, the, the press there and uh, harvest gondola and all the tanks. It takes uh, at least a week or so to clean everything and get it ready for this year's harvest. Um, how we decide when to pick uh, grapes is uh, a tough question and uh, we wanted to have a little poll here asking you which you thought was the top consideration for, when to deter for determining when to harvest the grapes. Is it the flavor? Is it the sugar level or is it the weather? Uh, please please uh, send in your answer and we'll have a quick uh, chance to see how people voted and then I'll tell you how I feel, uh, uh, which is the most important consideration, although all three of these are considerations that play a role in our determining when to, to start harvest. Um, Harvest, as I said, started uh, a little early this year. We're, as I said, we're done with the Chardonnay, so we probably started about 10 to 14 days earlier than normal. And uh, here are the results that have come in. That was quick. Thank you for all the people who uh, went out on a limb and uh, 
guess what the answer for us is. Uh, it looks like 14% uh, voted for flavor, 80% sugar level, and 7% for weather. Well, in fact, for us, the most important factor is flavor. Um, sugar level, that impacts the final alcohol. Uh, it could, the wine might be a little lower or a little higher given a certain year, but flavor is of utmost importance. And obviously we look at the weather quite a bit as well. Um, whether we might have rain coming or heat spell or even uh, a projected power loss these days or lightning strikes, who knows? But um, those are the three main criteria that we look at uh, when we're deciding when to pick. And it's slides, uh, the photographs in front of you on the left is uh, a very common sight. Uh, David, Sarah, and myself talking about how things are shaping up after having been out and tasted the, tasting the grapes. Um, the picture in the, in the middle is uh, dad and our dog and myself when we go out in the vineyard and look around as well. And, and then uh, on the right, I'm uh, sampling some grapes. So um, definitely flavor is the most important thing. And the way we test that is the only, the only way we can. We pick a few grapes, pop them in our mouth as we go down row after row. Uh, tasting the grapes, which we did today, looking at uh, the red grapes and how soon we think they'll be ready. Um, we pick by machine. Uh, you see a beautiful photograph of our lovely machine there on the right and with the part of the team there on the left. We have been machine harvesting for probably 40 years. Uh, we're on our third machine that we've owned. This one we purchased uh, a couple of years ago. It's uh, quite, a, quite a great machine. It picks very cleanly and delivers the fruit in a great condition to the winery. There are a few reasons listed there why we choose to harvest by machine. Uh, the first one is a, a big consideration uh, labor is an issue these days, getting more and more of an issue as anybody that's uh, looked on the news and listened to the stories of Bag Ag knows. But uh, even before that, we made a commitment many years ago that we would prefer to keep our full-time crew busy 12 months out of the year and minimize uh, bringing labor for a short amount of time, just because we want our employees to have the same benefits that, uh, that we have. In other words, uh, full-time employment, paid holidays, vacation, 401k, medical insurance, all those sorts of things, because that, that's a key to our sustainable approach to the business. The machine also allows us uh, to pick exactly when we want to. Sometimes we'll start picking and after an hour we decide the grapes aren't quite as ripe as we thought they were and we can stop. Or there have been years where it was going to rain the next day and we picked 16 hours straight by machine. Uh, that's a little harder to do with a hand crew. And, uh, and the other reason, as I mentioned, it does an extremely good job of picking the vines uh, cleanly, leaving very little fruit. Uh, breaking very few canes on the vine. And uh, that's important to us, important especially to the vineyard crew who's put a whole year's worth of effort into bringing the crop along to this point. And they know that uh, next year is another year where the nut vines need to be in good shape uh, for pruning. Here's a quick snapshot, a couple of photographs of how the harvest actually occurs. The bottom uh, photo on the left is a picture of the machine harvester coming towards us. It's, the machine is, in essence, a large tractor that straddles a row of grapevines. And as it drives over that row of grapevines, it has flexible rods underneath that impact the canopy and knock the individual berries off, which is why you saw stems 
in that previous photograph uh, still on the vine. And those berries are, they fall into a conveyor system that then conveys them up on top of the machine. They go through a fruit sorter and then into small, uh, well, small, relatively small half ton uh, receiving hoppers on either side of the machine. And then at the end of the row, we dump those hoppers into one of our two gondolas, which one of which you see there. These are in essence a large stainless steel box on wheels that we pull behind a tractor, which then delivers the grapes promptly to the winery. And in the third photograph there, you see one of those gondolas. This is a gondola that actually tips it lifts and tips the grapes, and as it tips, you turn on a, a motor that vibrates them very gently out of the, out of the uh, gondola there and into the fruit sorter. So, um, very clever system that we have. All this is uh, European equipment that uh, we found in various trips over to France. Um, Let's see, we have another poll here. Many of you have probably noticed the term estate bottled appears on all of our labels. And it appears on the labels of other wines as well. Um, not a lot of wines, but uh, you, you notice them from time to time, generally tend to be the smaller wineries. And this is uh, a legal term, I'll give you that hint, uh, defined by law. And the question here is, does it mean the wine is bottled at the winery? Or does it mean that 100% of the grapes are grown at the winery, made into wine and bottled at the winery? Or does it mean that the estate owns the bottling line? Um, as I mentioned, we are estate bottled, uh, an estate bottled winery. And I will be interested to see uh, what the results of the poll are here, because it's, if you're not in the business, you probably wouldn't know, you might not know what the correct answer was, but uh, surprisingly enough, 95% of the respondents got the right answer, and the right answer is that 100% of the grapes are grown at the winery, made into wine by, and bottled at the winery which has obvious quality ramifications and we're in a state bottled winery. It means that we have control of the process from planting the vineyard all the way through to bottling the wine. And in our case, we actually do own our own bottling line, but we could bring a mobile line in uh, and still uh, be able to use that uh, those two words on the label. Uh, it also allows us, um, obviously we have intimate knowledge of the vineyard, as I said, because it's right outside the winery. If you've been here to, to visit, you know we're surrounded on uh, one side by, by our vineyard. And uh, we love that aspect of, of, of our business and are committed to staying as an estate bottled winery which means that we cannot buy any grapes and that has been a challenge at times when the yields are low. Um, uh, the last poll that we have, I believe it's the last poll and this is before I turn it over to David, our vineyard manager. Uh, what do you think keeps David up at night worrying uh, during harvest? Is it the weather? Is it the machine and its mechanics? Is it the team? Or is he so relaxed that he doesn't really worry about anything because the goal is clear to pick grapes? And I will let David answer that question for you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is David Hubel. I'm the vineyard manager here at Hafner Vineyard, and I have been since 2010, making this my 11th harvest. So kind of an interesting question there when Kate told me it would be posed to everyone. 
I thought, I wonder what everyone is going to think. It, uh, there's plenty of things that can keep a vineyard manager up at night. And I see now that the results are in, a lot of you thought it was the weather. Well, if you've been farming as long as I have, you probably know what the weather's going to be tomorrow already for two or three weeks because you look at every weather model. And actually, this time of year, I go to bed quite happy and quite relaxed every night because we've worked hard to get to this point and there's only one thing left to do get up and pick some grapes. So I tend to sleep pretty well. <clears throat> so we thought that we would take a moment to go over a day in the life of a vineyard manager at harvest. And my alarm goes off at 2.45 a.m. And first priority of the day is to prepare myself a cup of coffee. I usually sit down, enjoy that, give some thought to what we're going to do, and also just take a moment to reflect on the day. I generally wander outside. I live here on the ranch, so it's a pretty easy commute. Step outside, wander over to the shop, and uh, usually by 3.30 or so, I'm starting to open up doors, turn on lights, and uh, get the machine fired up. It, uh, as Park said, it's a, it's a big tractor that straddles the row, and uh, basically everything on the tractor is run uh, via hydraulics, and there's a big tank of hydraulic oil and a big hydraulic pump, and uh, it's good for all that stuff to get warmed up before we get going. Just before four o'clock, uh, I usually greet the crew who's already gathered, and uh, we talk about what we're gonna do where we're intending to pick that day, how many gondolas, and uh, all the details. And with that, I hop in the machine. We've got a couple tractor drivers that hop on the tractors with the gondolas, and the rest of the crew goes out getting ready to pick a few grapes by hand because the machine doesn't do a very good job with the vines that are at the ends of the row, so that's going to be their job for the day. The first gondola of Chardonnay usually arrives at the winery about 4.45, and typically I've started picking about five to seven minutes after four o'clock. It then takes about another hour and 15 minutes to pick four gondolas, which is the amount of grapes that are needed to fill our two presses one time. So at that point, we take a little break. I often stop back by the house say good morning to my family. My wife and two daughters are usually getting ready for school and uh, gives me a chance to say hello. At that point, I'll swing by the winery, check in with Park, see if there's anything about the fruit so far that he'd like to comment on. Maybe adjustments need to be made to the machine. Sometimes there's some grape skins from the day before that need to be brought out to the vineyard uh, and added to the compost pile. And before long, I hop back in the machine because it's time to pick another round of four gondolas or two press loads. If everything goes well for the day, about 9.30, we deliver the last gondola. And it's customary for me to hop down from the machine and get on that last tractor myself and bring it to the winery. At that point, there's usually some more skins that have been generated from the first round of press loads. I'll hop in the truck and bring those out to the vineyard, and dump them on the compost pile. A couple of guys get busy washing the machine. This is a good chance to go over it, make sure that nothing is uh, out of place or needs attention, um, make any repairs that are needed. And uh, from there, usually it's time to clock out for the day. And uh, at that point, I'll usually go for a run around the valley or some other kind of exercise. Uh, 9.30 bedtime, get up tomorrow, do it all over again. So. That is a typical day. Uh, on any given year. Now, taking a, taking a moment to, to look at the 2020 vintage, it really starts in November of the previous year. So November 2019, the last grapes have been delivered to the winery, and the very next day we get started working on the next vintage. And that usually means pre-pruning. So there's some work to be done to the vines to get them ready. Uh, it's not quite time to prune them finally, um, 
that those last few cuts leave the vine vulnerable to disease. And so we put them off as late as possible, um, which is part of our strategy for uh, maintaining health in the vineyard. Winter of 2020 was fairly dry. It, uh, we saw about 22 inches of rainfall and normal for this area would be about 35 inches. So along with that came some warm temperatures and all of that uh, allowed us to work quickly through our pruning duties this year, but also meant uh, kind of an early bud break. Um, looking back at the calendar and other vintages, this one um, was pretty in line with 2014 and uh, I was able to, to track that throughout the year and, and, and actually we stayed pretty on track with 2014 throughout. Uh, March of 2020 was a lively month um, and it was punctuated with a few frost events. My alarm went off, uh, I believe it was eight times total. I started the system to protect our grapes from the threat of frost uh, four times this year. And in addition to those, <laughs> lovely weather events. Uh, we had a couple hailstorms, and that's always something that'll keep you on your toes. An aggressive enough hailstorm could actually pose real danger to the vineyard, knocking some of the new buds off. If you look in the upper right hand corner of this slide, you'll see an emerging bud. That is what bud break looks like. And this year in the early part of March. So April and getting into May, we're talking about the rapid growth phase. And this is when vines focus on growth. They're growing very quickly. If you look at the top right-hand corner to the lower right-hand corner, you'll see that tiny little bud grows into that canopy that you see uh, in that short amount of time. This May was particularly interesting. We, uh, we had seven days where the temperatures were 95 degrees Fahrenheit or above. And in between those heat spikes that happened on, I, I believe it was over four separate events, uh, we had rainstorms along with some more hail. So it was a very interesting month in May, uh, but thankfully there weren't any lasting consequences from any of that weather. If you look to the bottom left hand corner, you will see some grapes that are a mixture of colors. That's what we call verasion. And verasion is the time when uh, red grapes take on color in their skins, white grapes turn sort of a golden color from a, a more green color. The new shoots from this year harden off and lignify and they take on a beautiful sort of brown color. And this year that all happened a little on the early side. It was uh, mid to late July in 2020. It had been a really rather warm summer up to that point. And in August, there was an old visitor that came back that I hadn't seen for a few years. And that was eight glorious days of morning fog. I can't remember the last time that we had an extended period of fog in the mornings and it was very welcomed. And I think it did this vintage uh, a real service and um, allowed for maturity to come on at a nice even pace and I think contributed to some, some really nice uniformity this year. And at that point, I start sugar sampling and get ready because uh, lo and behold, it was time to start picking grapes August 23rd this year and yet another harvest has begun. Uh, so highlights from the Chardonnay harvest this year, it is looking like a very high quality year. The grapes were just absolutely a pleasure to sample and try throughout August. Uh, yields were a little on the low side, not necessarily a bad thing. It's always nice to have more, but we'll take what we can get and things weren't too far off this year. So you can see here, oh, oh hi. <laughs> now I can see myself and I believe we are going to transition now to a question and answer period. At this point, I'll welcome Park back in. I was uh, interested to hear David's uh, assessment of the harvest. I guess I would agree pretty much. Uh, quality looks exceptional. 
I was a little more disappointed about the yields than David was, but that's uh, part of the course. We were down 12 to 25%, depending upon which block uh, we, we picked. That was uh, uh, below a average, 10 year average, but um, you can't get too upset about that because uh, everybody else was down on Chardonnay. We don't know yet what uh, the Cabernet yields will be like, but uh, the bright side is that when you have a low crop, it means that next year the market's going to firm up for that uh, crop. So that, that'll be a good thing. Um, we're going to answer some questions, but I thought I'd start with one that came in. Uh, this was a uh, question we received uh, already today. And, it is, how do you know when you have a particularly good vintage and are there any signs already evident in this year's crop? Well, I would say that flavor is, is obviously one of the big things, but I think growing season, as Dave would, would uh, I'm sure agree and has alluded to that it's uh, you know a nice moderate growing season. If you have a lot of heat spikes, you get uh, raisining or sunburn on the fruit. Uh, can take a toll on the acidity and the flavor in the wine. So, um, you know, you get a sense of it as you go through the growing season, uh, how, how the weather has been um, impacting the flavors. And uh, again, this, this year looks exceptional so far. We'll see uh, how it continues into the red, into the red harvest. Uh, Kate is going to read some other questions, and I guess David and I will decide who gets to answer them. So here's Kate. Hi, thanks so much for for tuning in and listening and asking questions. Um, so we'll answer some that came in via the Q and A, and I'll pose them to Dad and David. Um, one of them that came in earlier was. Why do we pick so early in the morning? Um, poor David doesn't get much sleep. So why is it that we pick so early? You want to answer? Um, uh, it's not because I don't want David to get much sleep. Um, but in fact, we pick uh, as early as, as possible because we want the grapes to come in as cold as possible. So usually what we do is we figure that the air temperature is gonna to start to warm up around 9.30 or 10. And then we figure out, we back off uh, figuring how long it's gonna take us to pick those 20 tons of Chardonnay that we wanna bring in each morning. And that determines when we, when we start. And we wanna pick when it's as cold as possible for a couple of reasons. Uh, the machine certainly works better when it picks cool. Uh, and there are some uh, reactions that go on in the grapes. Once you pick them, the juice starts to extract phenolic material from the skins, which we don't really want much of in a white wine. And this reaction is slower when it's cooler. So that's kind of the main reason that we... Uh, that we pick when it's as cold as possible and early. Um, so let's see, one of the questions was, um, what do you do when you predict, um, or what do you do to protect from unexpected hail or rain? Um, Okay. <laughs> well, uh, so, I mean, rain and hail, we've all experienced it. There's not a lot that you can do. So, honestly, uh, I just cross my fingers and hope that everything's going to come out okay. Um, and, really, there's not a lot you can do if it is a particularly destructive storm. Thankfully, I've been farming grapes now for a little over 20 years, and uh, so far, so good. I haven't seen uh, a damaging hailstorm, but uh, what keeps me up at night prior to harvest, like in the springtime when the vines are most vulnerable, are the stories that Park has told me about some of the catastrophic hail events that he witnessed in France. So the, the answer is not a lot we can do besides hope. 
Um, I'm going to answer a couple of the, or ask a couple of the questions that came in beforehand. Um, so thanks for emailing them in. Um, someone asked, you know, half their wines are so consistent year to year. How are you able to maintain that consistency given different weather each year? You want to answer that? Our goal isn't necessarily to replicate the wine year in, year out, but uh, since day one, the winemaking style hasn't really changed. The grape source has remained the same. For the most part, at least two thirds of the full-time production staff, myself and Sarah, have remained unchanged. So even though the weather does impact the, the the quality of the grapes, the flavor of the grapes, it's not that significant, uh, fortunately, in California as compared to, say, France, where every now and then you'll get a hailstorm that ruins the crop or you'll get rain in the middle of harvest. Uh, fortunately, California, this climate where we are blessed to grow grapes, is pretty conduc conducive to uh, year in, year out making quality wines. So while we might not have the rain and the weather of um, the more challenging areas to grow grapes like France, you know, people have been asking on here, um, you know, how, you know, how, do, how have we been able to protect from wildfires and um, is there, is there a way that you can, you know, how does that affect, affect the vine? Well, that's a very good and very timely question. Um, and one that we've, um, <coughs> excuse me, worked on a lot since last year. Last year, the Kincaid fire came down onto our property right behind the winery. And as a result of that, we started looking at ways to uh, reduce the fire risk around the property and harden the winery. So we've done, made some changes, um, done some, uh, a lot of fuel reduction up on the hill, pulling out brush, limbing trees up. We had goats come in and uh, clear a couple of areas. And um, to some extent, it's just the roll of the dice. So far this year, we've been blessed. Um, the fire is not near us, although I will admit we tracked it very carefully every day. And the smoke has stayed away from us. Um, so we, um, uh, unfortunately it seems that this is, uh, something now, uh, every year we've had four significant fires in the last four years. So, I mean, this year and the previous three years. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, not a fun, not a fun part of living in California. So I'm gonna ask a question of David um, that came in by email. And that was, can you share a few of our sustainability practices in the vineyard? So I was warned that this question was coming and I warned that if we uh, had the time uh, in about eight hours or so, I could probably explain sustainability in the vineyard. But when I was told I had to keep it shorter than that, I chose a couple of things that uh, are some of my favorites. and. And probably uh, chief among them is, uh, so vineyard are, vineyards are planted in rows, as you've no doubt seen in the pictures that we've shown you today. And uh, underneath the vines, just like any place else, uh, native vegetation wants to grow basically weeds, right? And those weeds could be controlled chemically, or they could be controlled in the way that we do it, and that's by machine. Uh, it's a bit of a labor of love. The machines, because of the work that they do, um, they're beat up pretty badly uh, every day that they go out and do their thing. And so I, I'm kept busy uh, keeping them in order. We have two different machines. One's called the Radius, that's made by Clemens. Uh, it's kind of a, uh, an undervine cultivator that relies on uh, like knife-like blades that run just underneath the soil and uproot 
the plants. And then we have another piece of equipment that's made by a company called Blank, the same company that makes our harvester. Uh, and it has more of a rotating uh, mode of action and it leaves the berm really nice and clean. And, uh, and so that's one of the practices that we use to improve our sustainability. Thank you. Um, so we've talked a little bit about Chardonnay harvest and there was a question, you know, can we, can we comment on how the red grapes are at this point and when we think we might pick? I'm not sure who wants to take that one. <laughs> Ultimately, probably the winemaker. I'll give my guess, and then David can give his guess. Um, we were actually out tasting uh, Cabernet Petit Verdot and Malbec today. They are a ways off. The canopies look good. Um, I'm going to guess probably we'll be picking Cabernet by the end of the month. So three to four weeks from now. Well, I'll let David guess. So uh, there, there's, there's, a, uh, there's an age old dynamic between grape grower and winemaker, and uh, it's usually playful um, and, and also um, neither of us are ever right. Uh, <laughs> you, you, gotta, you take it as it comes. Where I see things right now, um, the Malbec, I think, is, uh, is going to come in first. I think that that's probably two to three weeks away. Uh, the Petit Verdot, interestingly enough, almost always comes in within five days of uh, October 15th, but not this year. I think it's probably going to come in in that first week of October, let's say. But uh, as far as the Cabernet goes, Park just said end of the month. I'm going to hold into that. Um, and it seems like that's probably an accurate guess. Let's just, I'm gonna scroll through some of the questions. Um, this is so sweet. Um, one of the questions is how is Dick or grandfather um, and how does he stay involved in the winery? So I'll let Dad speak to that. By the way, thanks for sending all these questions in. It's quite fun to uh, see what people want to learn about and to answer questions. Uh, thanks for asking about that. He's doing well. He uh, stays engaged because we all uh, still value his knowledge and his wisdom. And we talk to him on a daily basis. He has dinner with one of us every night. And uh, we will go out in the vineyard together from time to time and look at things, taste some grapes. Um, but, uh, He's not enjoying uh, the lock up uh, from COVID-19, but he does tend to visit from afar uh, friends and they come and, and say hi to him as well. But yeah, we are blessed every day that uh, we get to be with that. Just gonna look through some of the questions that we received um, earlier. Um, what, I like this one, what has been a favorite vintage for each of you and why, and which has been the most challenging? Who wants to start? Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to let out a little secret here. The 20 teams had a lot of really nice vintages. Um, I, I can't think of one between 12 and 20 that I didn't think was of particularly good quality. I could have done without the fires of the last few years, but uh, I don't know, 2020 is shaping up to be one of my favorites. Uh, the, the flavors this year, just they're really a pleasure to go out and experience. As far as vintages that have not been my favorite, 2011 takes the cake. It was, uh, it was a rough fall. There was a lot of rain. Uh, and uh, yeah, I can remember suffering through that one. So I'd have to stick with that. I would agree with David that of uh, recent vintage, uh, 2011 was the most challenging. Um, favorite vintages, 
I don't know, to be honest with you, I love every, every harvest. Um, this is the time of year that winemakers live for. And um, if you don't like the long hours, then you should be looking for a different profession because this is, it's too exciting not to enjoy what's going on right now. And as far as the wines themselves, you know, I learned early on back in the early 80s when I had a vintage that I wasn't very fond of and I won't name that vintage, but there were people that came up to me years later and said, you know, my favorite vintage was this one. And I realized everybody's tastes are different. And the ones that I like the most, other people are, aren't going to think they're great and vice versa. So um, every year presents its unique challenges, but um, for, the most part, for the most part, they're always pretty enjoyable. Um, let's see. A couple just technical questions. Um, which are some different clones that we grow? And then also, um, when we got earlier, was at what high temperature do the grapes on the vines stop producing sugar? And well, without getting too technical about it, um, I will mention a, a detail. On the underside of a grape leaf, there are small pores through which transpiration happens. They're called stomata. And there's a measurement called stomatal conductance, which is the degree to which those stomata are open and tra transpiring. So in other words, they're releasing moisture into the air and they begin to shut down between 90 and 95. And at 95 Fahrenheit, usually about 95% of the stomates are closed. And at that point, you're not making much sugar. So I'd say 95 in round numbers, but anything above that, you're not ripening much. And clones, gosh. Well, so for Chardonnay, we have Dijon clone 76, as well as clone 15. We have a little bit of clone four as well. In Cabernet, clone four, uh, as well as clone six. And Malbec, we have clone 595. We've recently planted clone 596, but we haven't harvested any grapes from that yet. We also have Petit Verdot, oh, and there's another Malbec block, lest I forget, that is also clone four. And we have Petit Verdot clone two. We have an older mature vineyard of Petit Verdot, and then we've also planted another one that I look forward to uh, harvesting a crop from for many years to come, uh, starting probably next year. So thanks everyone, you've been very active on the Q&A. Um, I'm sorry that we won't get to all of them, but I did receive this one question um, via email that I thought would be really nice to Q&A with, which is, what is the most fun about harvest? Let's sit there. Um, the most fun about harvest, uh, the long hours, no. Um, well, for a winemaker, it's the fact that in about one week's time, you go from grapes to wine. So big transition, uh, active fermentations, great aromas in the winery and in the caves. You know, and then the rest of the year, it's just uh, aging and uh, slow changes. But it, it is so exciting to see the fast changes. And uh, it's nice to be involved in a family business where everybody wants to come in and get in on the harvest. Kate comes in on the weekends and brings her daughter who loves to look at tractors and trucks and pumps and all kinds of things. So it's, uh, it's nice, uh, it's, it's a great time of year, really fun. Well, no secret, uh, my favorite time of harvest is bringing in the very last gondola. And the reason being, uh, for me, uh, I really think about the year as a whole, and for a good portion of it, I feel like I'm carrying around like a delicate object that's extremely valuable. It's going to feed the winery, which then feeds all of us who work here, and it's vulnerable and I've got to worry about it 
and there's work to be done. And then on that last day, driving in that last gondola, when the last berry goes to the fruit sorter, I can take a deep breath because another year is gone. So for me, it's that last day, no doubt about it. Well, thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, as Scott said before, it's, this is definitely not how we anticipated greeting all of you, um, but it's made for a fun way to connect and um, I hope you enjoyed it. We have a couple others that are coming up um, on September 16th at 4.30. Dad and I will be joining a conversation hosted by the Alexander Valley Wine Growers, along with our neighbors, Robert Young Winery, and um, the chef from the Three Star Michelin restaurant in Healdsburg, Single Thread. And so we'll be talking about the ageability of Chardonnays. And so if you'd like to join that, um, you can email me. Again, on September 25th at four, we will be hosting our fall releases virtual tasting. So we'll taste the 2018 Chardonnay and the 2016 Next Red that will be released shortly. And we'll also taste their two prior vintages so we can see how the wines age over time. And then the third sort of virtual experience that we're gonna do is we're gonna try and to, to reach some new people, to introduce ourselves to some of your friends who might not know about Hafner. So if you have people who you think wanna learn a little bit about us, um, connect them with me. And if you want to join any of those virtual tastings or order any wine for them, just email me or call us. My email is kate at hafnervineyard.com or you can find everything on our website. Um, but it's, it's just been a pleasure to chat with you and um, thank you so much for joining us and I hope you tune in another time. So.